The protagonist was at the place of execution. In front of her stood a girl named Alexandra. Weeping, Alexandra Castalia could not understand how the protagonist dared to do such a thing, because the girl was only a half-blood member of the royal family. The protagonist looked at her, remembering that all her actions were for the sake of giving her sister the place of empress. Those around her were not surprised by such an act from Charisse, as they believed that such a thing should have been foreseen long ago. Alexandra tearfully pretended that she would never have suspected her sister of treason. But it was all an act of publicity, for when the time came for farewell, Alexandra, leaning over her sister's ear, wished her a speedy death, for the girl had already fulfilled her part. After that, when the Empress moved away, the execution began. A system window popped up in front of the protagonist, which offered her to interrupt the game. She was angry at the fact that her whole life ended this way, so she preferred to finish the game on her own. The people around her noticed a change in the environment, everything started to shake, but no one knew that it was actually a reboot. The protagonist at the same time found herself unbound by her shackles and smiling sweetly reminded Alexandra that without her help, the girl would never have been able to become empress. Then the end of the game came. Then the protagonist took off her virtual reality helmet and did a little warm-up. She was sad about spending the last of the money she had invested in advancing in this game. She had relatively recently purchased this game, which had quickly gained popularity with the public. The game was called She Became the Little Genius of the Royal Family. The plot of the game is to choose one of the heirs, who must be made emperor. The girl was hard given the second part of the game, where it is necessary not only to put the chosen heir to the role of emperor, but also to prevent the end of the world. The main character of this game is a girl named Cherise, who chooses the emperor with his secret hand of power. But to choose and create an emperor, the player must first set their status and choose the occupation they will use. The profession that the protagonist chooses is pharmacy. Initially, she only wanted to prevent the character from being dispatched. But designing, creating, and selling medicines in the game allowed her to make a huge fortune. But Alexandra didn't believe in Charisse's influence and killed her. And because of that, the story was cut short. Frustrated with the game, the girl decided to give it one last chance and entertain herself before going to work. But suddenly, when she put on her virtual reality goggles, she noticed that the game screen started freezing. Initially, the girl thought that the problem was her furry pet who stepped on the helmet, so hitting him a couple of times, she brought the screen back to normal. But to her surprise, as soon as she entered the menu, she saw a new notification. When she clicked on it, an unusual animal appeared, which the girl had never seen before. The girl was given a chance to participate in a special event only for players of the most difficult level. This opportunity was extremely rare, so the girl was given only a minute to think about it. But the protagonist did not like this offer, so she decided to reject it, not expecting that when you clicked, automatically start confirming the game. But it wasn't free. She had to pay several hundred million dollars to enter the game, and some of the money had already been debited from her account. The next moment, when the girl opened her eyes, she saw that she was in a familiar body, and next to her was another child who was constantly yelling at her. Looking around, the protagonist realized that she had often seen this place in the game, and it was familiar to her. But suddenly, she again received a notification from the game, which asked her to deposit the rest of the money. When she saw the total amount, she realized that she didn't have that kind of money. So when the debit didn't happen, her player title automatically changed, and now she was a debtor. All the girl had to do was scream in despair. But her cry of despair was heard by the girl standing in front of her. She kept ordering the protagonist to get on all fours. It was Alexandra, but she looked too young, because at the beginning of the story, well known to the protagonist, she was 15 years old. But now was not the time to think about that, so the protagonist opened her account with the intention of deleting the account because she could not afford to pay that much money. But there she saw that the product purchased in the game was non-refundable, and so she was fined 10 billion gems. Because of her own shock, the protagonist completely ignored Alexandra, who, seriously angry, began to beat the girl with her feet. But this reaction, although it confused her, seriously angered her, so Alexandra felt that she needed to be even more strict with her sister. Seeing this same girl only in the last attempt of the game, the protagonist knew exactly how much Alexandra, her character, and appearance do not match. Even Cherise herself thought it was a stupid idea to beat up a child just because he demanded to stop bullying. But suddenly, 
The girl stopped and something in her head snapped. Then, one by one, the memories that belonged to this body and how much abuse little Charisse had endured began to appear in her head. Then the heroine finally got all the memories, including the memories of the country she was in. Castalia is a country where the imperial family is honored. But the main character Charisse is far from that, as she was only a half-blood, and because of that she was always looked down upon and her life was not like other nobles. In the original story, she is the one entrusted with the key role of choosing the ruler. But no matter what choice she made, every time the game ended rather miserably for her because the challenger she chose turned out to be a villain. But now, thanks to Charisse's memories, the girl realized what to do next. At the very least, she was going to escape from this place. And to do that, she had to get out of the palace and find a safe haven. But what bothered the girl the most was that now she didn't depend on anything and could make a decision completely on her own. She even felt a little uncomfortable, so easily controlling someone else's body. At this point, she got an alert that advised her to find a way to escape from an angry Alexandra, and if she failed, the game would be over. At that moment, Alexandra grabbed Charisse by the hair. The girl was pleased with her complete control over the weak Charisse and her sense of impunity. But Charisse hatched a plan and let the villain get close to her. Then she hit her head in the jaw with all her might. While the enraged Alexandra was trying to recover and screaming, the protagonist had already started to escape from the room and ran out into the corridor. In the corridor of the Imperial Palace was a lot of empty rooms, and to begin with, the girl decided to hide in some of them. Near one of the doors, Charisse noticed the same rabbit, who had previously sold her a special offer of the game. This made the main character very angry, so she demanded that the rabbit stop and let her revenge be done. But while she was chasing this rabbit, she didn't notice how she got into some dusty room, covered with cobwebs and very similar to a pantry. No matter how much Charisse searched for it, she couldn't find the rabbit, so she sat down on the ground disappointedly and decided to take a breath. She needed shelter anyway, and she managed to hide in this place in time. When the story began according to the original, the girl was already 15 years old, and not much was told about her life before that age. The main character's biggest concern was how she would be able to pay off her debt of 10 billion stones and how long it would take her, given that she was now enduring abuse in such a small and defenseless body. Looking at herself in the mirror, the heroine felt sorry for the situation she was in, though she admired how cute her character was. So focusing on those thoughts, Charisse thought positively and already more cheerfully began to think about her plan to earn money. The first task was to pay off her debt, but the next task was something even more impossible, namely to become the heiress to the throne. The third task was closed until the previous two tasks were completed. What she saw really shocked Charisse because this game was not just about the struggle between the Emperor's children, it was about the brutal struggle of all the descendants secretly setting each other up. The current Emperor was a man who was called the Incarnation of a God, and in 200 years, he had 14 grandchildren worthy of taking the throne. Among them, 11 actually fought for the throne. And in general, Charisse also participated in the struggle in the original story. The Princess was a dark horse who preferred to choose the most suitable candidate for the throne, and with this mission, the protagonist failed. So now she was worried about whether she could basically survive in this cruel world. The struggle for the throne was not even a question, and the more she was frightened by the possible task that lies under the third number. But while her thoughts were occupied with the game, she had already managed to find Alexandra, who went around the palace and found her in the window, smiling evilly. The girl marveled that the protagonist was so arrogant and really believed she could escape. Charisse was surprised at Alexander's ability to fly because only when becoming the heir to the throne in the game was given such an opportunity. Immediately after that, everything began to freeze and flicker, and there was a notice about the end of the game and that the second attempt had begun. That's when the protagonist found herself in that room in front of Alexandra and enduring the beating. The notification again informed her of the need to escape from her older sister. Then, the protagonist realized that she had probably misunderstood her own assignment in her first attempt, because the main condition was that she needed to escape, not get out on her own. And that meant that she could enlist the help of someone powerful enough to accomplish the task. Once again, angry at Alexandra's actions, the protagonist repeated her actions. But this time after the blow, instead of an angry scream, there was silence. And when Charisse turned around, she saw Alexandra in a frenzy, because with her blow, Charisse had broken her nose and she was bleeding. 
Immediately afterward, Sharice saw a system alert that praised her for her good punch and offered to help her stop the bleeding from the girl's nose in order to receive a reward of 10 stones. The protagonist was upset that now, when her life was in danger, she was being given such absurd tasks, also with such low pay, because 10 gems are pocket money for small children. Just as the arrogant Alexandra was about to get the upper hand on Charisse, the latter put her silk handkerchief to the princess's bleeding nose, hoping it would help stop the bleeding. Just then, Nanny promptly burst into the room. The arrogant Charisse thought that this woman had come screaming and was going to protect her, but instead, completely ignoring the protagonist, she rushed to the aid of the cranky Princess Alexandra. Then, the disappointed protagonist remembered that this nanny, like everyone in this luxurious palace, had never been on her side, because Charisse was absolutely nothing to everyone. But Charisse didn't want to take it anymore, so turning to the nanny, she reminded the woman of her presence and the fact that the woman had just dared to call her a wretch. Initially, the confused nanny was very panicked because the girl had never shown her own temper before. But after she again began to shout angrily at Princess Charisse, demanding at least some explanation for her behavior, the nanny reminded her that Alexandra was the emperor's child and that Charisse could be executed even if the girl had a scar. Then, too, using her acquired memories, the protagonist wondered if she would have been treated differently if her parents had been alive. But her thoughts were quickly interrupted by the fact that Alexandra didn't want to involve anyone else in this fight. So the angry Alexandra stopped the woman and decided to teach the protagonist a lesson herself. So she applied her magic spell and a magic circle immediately appeared under her feet. The angry girl could make objects around her levitate with her own strength, for she had applied the dragon heart technique. It was the embodiment of Alpha and Omega, as well as the symbol of the Imperial family. And, as a precious artifact, the dragon heart was honorably passed down from generation to generation. The story goes that in a thrilling battle with an honorable dragon ruler, the illustrious emperor emerged victorious, forever leaving his name in the writings. And the heavens responded to the emperor's valiant feat by bestowing upon him a great reward, a second heart that possessed the power of a mighty dragon. Since then, the imperial family has passed this sacred relic from generation to generation. While the protagonist was outraged that Alexandra was actually going to vaporize her, she received an alert from the system about the player's skill change. At that time, she gained a level F attack as well as a level F defense. Having already studied the abilities, Charisse began to read through the terms and conditions, trying to understand any skill. Other than that, she saw that due to her role as a player, her pharmacy was at the highest level. But unfortunately, this skill was unavailable to her due to her debts, so her maximum formation level was D. Without wasting any time, Alexandra ordered the nanny to pounce on Princess Cherise and grabbed her and brought her to her knees. The woman immediately grabbed the princess and demanded that the girl apologize to Alexandra. The nanny was surprised that Cherise had not been taught manners at all by her parents. These words deeply hurt Cherise's heart, because if she had parents, things would have been different but she was not to blame for their absence. With more strength, the nanny pushed the girl away from herself, then grabbed her by her dress and roughly put her on her knees. And Alexandra extended her hand to the girl. The protagonist realized that she was required to kiss her hand as a sign of apology. But such a gesture is a sign of submission to a lord, and clearly not the kind of sign a princess should ask of another member of the imperial family. So after refusing, Charisse pounced on Alexandra and bit her leg hard, explaining that she really hadn't been taught manners, so she would behave as she saw fit. Seriously angry and gathering her power, Alexandra prepared to strike, while a panicked Charisse tried to find some way out of the room and prayed that there were some adults nearby. At that moment, a boy walking down the hallway responded to the shouting and came into the room, surprised that his sister had children to teach. It was Baikal the prince of the Northern Empire. The protagonist was amazed that this guy had come to save her. Baikal was very disappointed that his sister dared to teach the etiquette of the Imperial Palace to another member of the family. It was obvious that the presence of her brother was very intimidating to this girl, so she immediately apologized. But Baikal thought it was a silly excuse and reminded her that it was forbidden to threaten members of the Imperial family and use the heart of a dragon before the age of 10 and he was disappointed that Alexandra needed to be taught a lesson in order for her to learn this rule. 
When the nanny tried to justify Alexandra, Bakel ordered her to shut up, not wanting to listen to anyone. He also reminded the woman that she was the nanny of Princess Cherise specifically, not Alexandra at all, and as such, she was not supposed to take care of another person. Before leaving the room, Baikal approached the frightened, battered child and held out his hand to help her up. But the protagonist calmly explained that she was fine. Such openness of the child surprised Baikal, because he did not expect that Charisse was not afraid of him at all, as it was a great rarity. But for the protagonist, this guy was actually a savior, and a solid set of characteristics. She knew all about him through the system menu, which alerted her to the fact that Baikal was the father of the twins, Idsit and Hersey, as well as the older brother of the protagonist's mother. Additionally, the system alerted her to the fact that the guy had indigestion and that similar alerts would come to her if there was an opportunity for a special mission. Also, turning to Jakal, his assistant, Baikal asked the man to take the princess to a room in order for her to get some rest. Agreeing to accept the help, the protagonist rejoiced at her success, but was given another task. She needed to help Prince Baikal deal with indigestion in 48 hours and receive 1,000 stones. Such a reward obviously couldn't compare to the previous reward, so the protagonist was ready to take on this task. She immediately ran up to the prince. Cherise addressed him as her father and requested that he take her personally from this place. While Baikal was surprised at such treatment from the little princess, Jakal suggested that the girl, because she had forgotten about her parents, might actually consider him a father. After that, the protagonist noticed that her father was not feeling well, so she asked for a chance to help him. Despite his surprise, the man agreed, but looking carefully at the little girl, noticed the scars on her hands, so Cherise had to justify that all the wounds and abrasions were accidental, and she acquired them in the process of playing. The girl did so, because she knew that adults do not like problem children. So all it took was to be calm, obedient to make her want to be adopted, and it worked. So after picking the child up in his arms, Bacall wanted to personally take her to her room. He liked the fact that the girl wasn't afraid to call herself his daughter, and he wanted to observe her more. The main character didn't believe that she was able to pull off her plan, and at least someone finally took her side. But suddenly, she received a notification that the training had been completed and now her body was to rest. The protagonist slowly began to drift into sleep and didn't hear what happened afterward. The man who was leaving turned to Alexandra and demanded that she should not touch that child again, otherwise he would definitely take the girl into his custody. If that happened, Alexandra would have to answer for everything she had done before. In addition, he forbade Alexandra to leave the palace for the next month. In the meantime, Jakal tried to find out what they were going to do, but the prince calmly explained that he couldn't abandon the girl that wanted so much to be his daughter, and also demanded to find out from the princess's nanny what had happened here in the first place, as well as to deal with those responsible according to the law. The next time Princess Charisse woke up, she found herself on a soft and expensive bed that allowed her to get a good night's sleep. Plus, there was a delicious aroma all around her. Just then, upon hearing the princess's awakening, a maid came to her. She was the eldest daughter of the Everville family named Sophia, and the girl had previously served the prince. Her surname was well known to little Charisse, for despite the empire's 500 years of history, not only the names of aristocrats were known in it. Also left in history were the names of dozens of different families that served the imperial family, and among them, the Evervilles held the most honorable place, and they were known as the most loyal servants. Realizing that Sophia could be useful in the future, the protagonist smiled happily at her, which made the servant girl genuinely pleased. Sophia immediately hugged the little princess and told her that she would be Charisse's nanny from now on. This was an order from the prince, who no longer wished to leave the little princess in such deplorable conditions where she could be treated so inappropriately. But Charisse knew the reason was because of her last name, so she wasn't surprised. Though she was glad that conditions had changed now, for this place suited her much better. Sophia, having started her duties, helped the protagonist to tidy up, and together they went through the corridors for breakfast. But the protagonist was very worried that she might be too voracious, so she only asked for some rice for breakfast, though the sounds of her hungry stomach gave away that she was insanely hungry. Also, with a smile, Sophia explained to the princess that Charisse would be here for a while, and those words made the girl worried 
she felt like she was disturbing Sophia and everyone else. But the maid convinced the princess otherwise, for among the many brothers and sisters, there was no one dearer to Baikal than Kiena. These words surprised Charisse, although she tried with all her might not to show it. The protagonist wondered why, despite their kinship, Baikal had abandoned her for so many years. But it soon seemed to the protagonist that she was looking for logic where there was none, for in any case she was now in a game and nothing more, so she should not let her guard down even if she knew the basic plot. Upon arriving at the beautiful garden, the hitherto hungry girl marveled at the amount of delicious food. Castalia was a famous empire that was renowned for its arts, and even the way the table was set showed the people's craving for the beautiful. Already at the table, Baikal immediately asked the girl about her food preferences. But the princess, convinced that the man liked nice and unpretentious children, explained that she did not have any special preferences, and she liked absolutely everything. The man, of course, was surprised by such adult behavior on the part of the little girl, but he didn't let it show. At this point, the protagonist once again received a notification from the system, reminding her that she still had an available task with a reward of 1,000 stones regarding the prince's indigestion. The protagonist was excited about the idea, wanting to earn some money, but she hadn't done anything like this in a long time and only remembered that when she was a child, her grandfather had stabbed her finger with a needle for indigestion. In addition, the protagonist remembered one of their last conversations, when the grandfather, learning about the girl's enrollment in the Faculty of Pharmacology, argued for a long time. The girl to the last tried to explain that her goal is to become a researcher for the sake of developing new drugs. But the grandfather, who all his life saw his granddaughter as a doctor, could not accept such a thing and thought that she was too ungrateful, as she did not appreciate the efforts and money invested in her, after which he even began to insult her. Of course, such memories made the princess sad, but she quickly pushed all her worries away, wanting to start eating in order to gain strength and think about future accomplishments. But to her disappointment, Baikal put pea porridge on the table. Seeing the displeasure on the girl's face, he changed the portion to cabbage stew. But when the little princess didn't like it either, Baikal reminded her not to be picky about her food, for she never once mentioned that she didn't like such dishes. Jakal was very amused by this situation from the outside, so, laughing heartily, he recommended the master to stop teasing the princess, who obviously did not want to become a vegetarian. Realizing the appropriateness of the assistant's words, Baikal asked him to relay instructions to the cook about changing the dishes to something containing meat. When everything was ready, the maid served the new food on the table. The new appetizing dishes really delighted the little child, so she began to eat, not denying herself anything and putting on portions of food herself. An elderly maid who saw this smiled and offered to help the princess. Allow me, the woman said and introduced herself. She was Count Lindensky's wife and also the maid in charge of setting the table, and the woman really wanted to take care of the little lady. After everything was eaten and the protagonist was satisfied, she decided to return to her mission of curing Bakel's indigestion. He immediately noticed the girl's curious look, so there was no point in keeping quiet about her plans. Gathering her strength, the girl ran up to the prince and asked his permission for a little experiment. Namely, she wanted to poke his finger with a needle. Of course, this request looked very strange, so both Sophia and Jakal were shocked and thought that the princess wanted to mess with the prince. The frightened protagonist had to explain to her assistant that such a method is very useful for healing and restoring digestion. She also had to explain how she knew about the prince's indigestion. The best explanation that came to the four-year-old's mind was that her father had eaten very little food, so she suspected some kind of problem. But what frightened her most about the situation was the silence of Baikal himself, who just looked at her and waited for some explanation. So she told that she had learned this method of treatment from a dragon that she had dreamt about at night. Also in this story, the girl mentioned the knowledge and medicinal herbs that this dragon had also told her. The princess wished to use her knowledge of the original story and her knowledge in healing as an excuse. Though despite the empire's connection to dragons, it still continued to look like an eloquent lie. After a bit of thought and consultation with Jakal, Bakel believed the four-year-old girl and gave the maid orders to prepare everything she needed. Then, opening her notebook, Sophia prepared a quill and listened attentively to Charisse in order to write down everything necessary. When Nanya received the list, she was very surprised at what was written, for the little girl asked to prepare a needle. 
and to avoid pain, the needle had to be the longest and thinnest possible. Also bandages, but Charisse did not forget to point out that they should be thoroughly disinfected. Satisfied with the knowledge of the little princess, the maid immediately went about preparing the necessary. At the same time, the protagonist recalled her experience of the game while in the original story. Charisse has not once tried to get into this palace, but every time it was an impregnable fortress for her, into which neither spies nor specially bribed servants could penetrate. And now she was brought here as an adopted daughter and was trusted, which couldn't help but make her happy. At the moment when Bakel wanted to remind the child that he was not her father, Sophia came and brought everything she needed. So the princess immediately grabbed the needle and rewound the prince's finger to avoid pain, after which she began to warm the needle. She explained to Jakal that this was done to avoid pain and further infection. But despite her determination, when the preparations were done and it was time to give the injection, the girl Raz worried, though she did everything quite accurately. So immediately after the injection, a notification window appeared, congratulating her on completing the mission and presenting her with a reward of a thousand stones. The man himself immediately felt much better and marveled at how quickly his condition had changed. Jakal was amazed at the girl's knowledge. Bakal, after stroking the child's head, praised her for the first time. And Jakal marveled that the little girl had dared to do such a thing, for many doctors had come to treat Bakal, but would immediately start shaking with fear as soon as they heard his voice. But this little child was not only not afraid to state his assumption about the disease, but also dared to prick him with a needle. But it wasn't that simple as the princess received a new alert informing her that her indigestion was only half cured and she was given a new task to completely cure the indigestion of the divine Prince Baikal. This was to be done using a plant growing in the garden of the Midnight Palace. She needed to find the necessary herbs and make a natural potion from them. The reward was as much as 10,000 magic stones, so the offer was favorable despite being time-consuming. When the princess began to think about the necessary plant, she immediately thought of plums, the symbol of eternity, because the flowers of this tree were beginning to break through the snow. She needed plums, because plum syrup is considered a natural remedy that improves digestion. In addition, it helped with minor ailments. The protagonist immediately thought of how to use this task in the future, because she could make more of this healing syrup, and then distribute to the knights, tired after training, thereby ensuring a good reputation. But first, the girl needed to know how long she could stay on the palace grounds in order to understand how much time she could count on. But unfortunately, now the girl could not find out anything because the two aides of the prince were actively talking about something, after which the man was immediately going to leave. But that meant that the girl would lose his trust. So she recalled their earlier arrangements. The man was to give her some sort of task to test her suitability to be his adopted daughter. Charisse had the realization that she was too easily replaced for this man. So, in order to survive, she was going to cling tightly to the Divine Prince, for he was the only person who could help her in this world. After thinking for a bit, Baikal smiled and informed the princess that he liked children who had fun playing. So, he suggested that she either run around in the garden for a while or study. He also specified that this task was very important, so he asked the princess to play well today and not to worry about anything and the next day to come to him with a report on the work done. The protagonist clearly did not expect such a development, but thought she could use the game as an excuse to make healing plum syrup. A little while later, the prince's assistant was surprised that the Lord decided to let the little princess carry out his treatment. In addition, the man was surprised that little Charisse didn't even realize how amazing it was that she had been able to touch Baikal, because he was under a powerful spell that he had removed especially for the girl. The man himself was not at all bothered by this. He was simply pleased that the girl he had brought into his palace was so amazing. Jakal was also pleased by the fact that the palace had become much brighter since the Lord's return. In addition, this palace was now also livelier thanks to the little starlet he had brought. Looking at the little girl playing, Baikal immediately remembered his little sister. And Jakal also thought that they were very similar. After all, after his sister's death, no one else had ever approached him so fearlessly and hugged him. The younger princess was exactly the same person. She wasn't the least bit afraid of Bacal. During the young princess's time in the palace, Jakal had already managed to gather her resume. The girl's mother was well known, but the father was impossible to find out. Jackal also learned that the girl had been very withdrawn since her birth, 
though it didn't seem that way to Baikal during their first meeting, for the child had shown herself from the very beginning. It seemed to Jackal that, most likely, such a drastic change in the child's character occurred after her rescue, because, perhaps, the girl saw in Baikal a person to whom she could turn for help. Next, the author reveals to us details relating to the political structure of the empire. The empire had a northern and a southern part, and despite the fact that both parts were one country, they had different emperors, but they never achieved equality in government. In fact, the real power belonged to the northern emperor. He was the first swordmaster to confront the dragon named Leochad Royal Castalia. His reign had already crossed the 150-year mark. In addition, the man was completely indifferent to his family and probably had no idea how many descendants he had. Although among others, he singled out his three children, whom he cherished very much, namely Jen, Chin, and Win. In addition, Baikal himself was a descendant of Win. Previously, Win represented the lineage of the only daughter of the Northern Emperor. The faction supporting the family was very powerful, much stronger than the Jen and Chin factions. But all of that was a thing of the past. When Baikal returned to his palace, he was horrified to learn that the other factions had begun to hate and shun them. But now, now somewhat calmed down, the man wanted revenge on those who had betrayed him, and Jakal was ready to provide his lord with a detailed plan to execute his revenge. The mere thought of neglecting Princess Charisse Wynne and misappropriating her property made Bakel angry. Anyone who committed such a sin clearly didn't value their life. Bakel gave orders to see if Charisse had any jewelry, and if not, to see if it had been confiscated for remelting. But in any case, the princess could not use the melted jewelry, so Bakel ordered to find a good craftsman. But he immediately abandoned the idea, because even though it was the most logical thing to entrust a craftsman to make the jewelry, it would take too long. So Bakel gave orders for Sophia to use the first level of the fourth floor and take whatever would suit the princess. Jakal immediately wrote a letter and sent a carrier pigeon. He already knew that the news would obviously please the maid, for it was a great honor to visit the place where the Lord's magic had been cast. Even though it was only the first level containing clothes and jewelry, it was still a great wealth. In addition, this floor also contained the jewelry that the man was going to give to the younger princess, his sister. But all of that was already a matter of days gone by. Baikal still remembered how a little girl, an exact copy of Charisse, had run up to him and asked him to play with her, and then crying and screaming for a long time if Bacal left in silence. The little girl had no idea that the prince was worried that his magic could tear her sister to pieces at his touch. Then, the man remembered his last conversation with his sister, when she explained that she no longer wanted to participate in the confrontation for the throne, as well as in the struggle of factions. And after thanking his brother, she fled in an unknown direction. Bakel believed that his sister would live happily ever after, so he had already resigned himself to it. But when he read the letter, he was shocked. But when he arrived, an even more horrifying sight awaited him. But what he saw, Baikal couldn't remember. It was not surprising. Every time the man tried to remember that day, his head ached violently. The reason for this was the strongest high magic that had been used to erase his memories, and even he, who had no less power, could not remove it. In order to cast this spell, it took him four years, which he spent at the bottom of the lake, and eventually became very weak. This procedure was also used to slightly suppress the southern emperor's power and restrain him. The northern emperor, terrified of Bakel's power, cast a spell on him and imprisoned him at the bottom of the lake, which was a very heartless act. But the man had never been known for his kindness. Not wanting to dive into bad events again, Bakal suggested to Jakal that they start their long conversation about Kiana's daughter and further plans for the girl. At this time, tired from playing in the garden, the princess sat down to rest under a tree and realized that she had found herself a really powerful and good protector. That's why she wanted to be the best daughter for him and charm the man. And then, with the help of power, easily fulfill all the tasks of the game and return to her world. But unexpectedly, Sophia, who found her, informed the princess that they had gained admission to the first level of the fourth floor. Although the protagonist had no idea yet what this meant to her. The girl knew that the Divine Prince lived in the Midnight Palace, in a three-story building, and the design of that building did not include a fourth floor. 
therefore, she didn't know how the man could hide such a large space all this time. But as it turned out, it was all because the fourth floor was completely created from his magic. And when Baikal became old enough, he had built this room using dragon heart magic. All of Baikal's trophies were kept there, jewelry, paintings, and fragments of important documents. And also, all the items were divided into five ranks according to importance. All the items on the fourth floor were so valuable that they couldn't be compared in value to anything else. And so a joyful Sophia wished she could go with the princess to the fourth floor right now. But the girl explained that first she needed to boil a compote from the fruit of the plum tree. Sophia was surprised by this because plums were considered inedible fruits, so their fruits had long been removed. The protagonist began to worry, but as it turned out, in the Midnight Palace even the most useless things were not thrown away for nothing, so the plum fruits were kept in storage. Smiling awkwardly, the girl realized how close to success she was, so she asked to delay going to the fourth floor and take care of the plum fruits first. The initially surprised maid smiled at the small child's idea and suggested that they go to the storage room together, where they soon arrived. In the meantime, Baikal and Jakal's conversation was gaining new momentum. They were discussing magic and the dragon heart the girl possessed. Even in that, she was very much like her mother. But unfortunately, the measuring device that Jakal had left outside the princess's room had completely failed to absorb any of her power, which meant that the princess could not use the power of a dragon and was an ordinary human. Bakal realized that in such a case, the girl would definitely not be able to participate in the battle for the throne from the age of 11 because it threatened her with mortal danger. Jakal suggested hiding her outside the palace, but the divine prince thought it was a useless solution. Even so, she would still be in danger. And the other members of the imperial family who had become aristocrats but continued to fight outside the palace would be a huge threat to her. Therefore, it was difficult to understand what decision would turn out to be the right one, because with her own strength, Princess Cherise clearly could not defeat even the weakest descendant of the emperor. There was a question of whether the girl would even be able to defend herself. But Baikal thought that there was one way, and the thought of it frightened Jakal, who tried to explain to his lord that he should think about it again. But the decision had already been made. Baikal, along with the girl, wanted to change the place of residence in order to keep the princess's reputation safe from rumors about her weaknesses. After all, if someone from the outside found out that she didn't have any power, then Charisse's reputation and her mother's reputation would be mixed with mud. And Baikal didn't want to see the name of the great Wynn family trampled. Now, Despite the conflict with the other families, everyone was still in awe of just one family name. But the problem remained that members of the imperial family couldn't move and enjoy protection without having a title. So Baikal decided to adopt the girl, and Jakal accepted the Lord's decision, deciding to take care of the matter first. Baikal still couldn't believe that he would have a child again. After all, he already had two older twin boys, but as befits the children of a divine prince, they were strong from childhood. The twins' dragon heart was in perfect condition, so Baikal had never worried about them. Therefore, this was the first time for him to worry about someone. Baikal was angry at the mere thought that his great-grandfather, the Northern Emperor, had allowed the girl to live in such contempt and had never once taken care of her. In order to ensure that such a situation would not happen again, the man decided not to rely on anyone else and personally take care of the matter. Then, during the conversation in the study, Bikal came to the conclusion that it was strange enough that the little princess talked about her dream with the dragon who was teaching her something. Initially, Jakal didn't understand why the Lord suddenly decided to talk about something like that, so he explained to the prince that dragons had long been patrons of the imperial family, so such a dream was quite possible. But from the expression on the man's face, the aide guessed that the prince probably suspected Charisse of lying. Remembering the girl's awkward face, Bakel could definitely tell that she was probably making up such an excuse, which was already more like the truth. Besides, judging from what the nanny said, the girl had never been taught anything. And naturally, she didn't know how to speak properly, nor did she know the rules of table ethics. However, she knows a lot of things, as if someone had taught it to her. And there was a possibility that such knowledge could indeed have been passed down to her from the dragon. Though the man decided not to speculate, and asked that the aide spread rumors that there was a princess who was under the dragon's protection, and that she was not a wretch, 
but had been educated by the dragon in her sleep. Jakal thought the idea was good enough, but he wondered how the man planned to announce that he was adopting his late sister's daughter. Even more troubling to him was how he would tell his two children, who should be returning from the academy soon. But wanting to deal with the matter later, the prince remembered the little tormentor Alexandra. The prince decided that he needed to come up with a good enough punishment for her for bullying Charisse. She was too, in addition to house arrest, also write letters of apology every day. Whether or not this was really Alexandra's work could be easily checked with her aura, so there would be no problem with that, and the punishment would be carried out. This idea especially appealed to Jakal, who loved intrigue in the imperial family and in the aristocratic world, and he had already begun to think over how Alexandra could be punished and what she should be sure to put in her letters. In the end, from that day began the confrontation between the Great Wind family and those who wished to subdue them. It was a struggle for the trampled pride of the family. Very soon, the prince must also tell Charisse that she had taken the place of the adopted daughter, but he decided to postpone such a conversation until the girl was finally accustomed to this palace. But Jakal was worried that such a small, bright child, like a newly hatched chick, might become nervous and even die of fright at such news. When the jokes were over, the man returned more seriously to his work and began to make a list of things necessary for the adoption. This list included books, documents, and baby clothes and items. Jakal felt that this was all necessary, as the methods that the divine prince had previously used with his twins were not suitable for raising a princess. After all, the man was a rather cold-hearted father who rarely ever praised his children, though he was proud of them. But suddenly the two men talking were distracted by the voice of a servant girl who announced the arrival of Princess Charisse, who wanted an audience. When the doors opened and Sophia had already entered, a small figure appeared from behind her. The young lady wanted permission to use all the plum fruits from the vault. Jackal was surprised by such a decision. After all, it was a known fact that plum fruits were inedible. After a little thought, Bakel remembered that he had never told the girl about his digestive problems before, but she had somehow guessed on her own that he needed help and had used a remedy he had never even thought of to help him. And most likely she had some idea this time as well. So after putting all the data together, the man authorized the little princess to use whatever resources she wished, and also asked Jakal to add one more item to the list. The aide was surprised at such sudden interest. He was especially surprised to hear that the man wanted to read books that described how a daughter was raised in an ordinary family. He was really serious about reading every possible book, analyzing them, and becoming the perfect father for this girl. Jakal was surprised that the prince had such a sudden desire to become a worthy parent. So he decided to help him and seriously began to select the necessary books, thinking long and hard about what he could use. Cherise also did not waste any time. She enlisted the help of the servants to fill the barrel with fresh fruit and explained to them that she would use the fruit to cure her stomach ache. The awkward gardener tried to explain to the princess that in all the life he had spent at his workplace, he had never heard that these fruits had any medicinal properties, and he had always had to endlessly harvest these fruits in the spring as soon as they appeared on the trees. This frustrated the girl, who realized how valuable the wild plum was, even though it didn't have a pleasant taste. Because of this, she was underestimated. But as she recalled her history, she explained that her knowledge was accurate because it was told by a dragon. This was the reason why the knowledge was so rare, and no one had known about it before. Although the adults didn't criticize the girl, they just hoped that despite her experiments, all the people who tried the cure would be all right. By then, all the preparations with the wild plum had already been completed, and so Charisse decided to start making the plum compote. The first thing they did was pour a bucket of sugar into the compote. Sophia realized that there was too much sugar and worried that the medicine might be ineffective because of it. But the princess convinced her that this was a necessary part of the preparation, for the wild plums were bound to sugary. After they had waited a sufficient amount of time, the rewashing of the plums began. This process was carefully supervised by the protagonist, making edits to her team. Sophia, wanting to help the girl, performed everything exactly as instructed. The protagonist noticed that some of the plums were spoiled and they would surely be unpalatable. Therefore, no compote would come out of them. So she quickly began to throw away the spoiled, overripe plums 
and was so engrossed in the process that she did not notice how she scattered everything around her and even hit the gardener in the head with one of the plums. For this she was very ashamed, but the man was very good-natured, so he forgave the girl and went to help her. It was necessary to take out all the pips from the fruit, and the gardener took this mission even too responsibly, so he began to quickly process all the fruits with incredible speed. The experience of several decades of work as a gardener was in evidence. The protagonist understood that this procedure was not necessary because the plum seeds had a high content of amygdalin, which is not dangerous when combined with water, but the plums containing the seeds were not suitable for syrup or compote because the seeds can get caught in the food and cause discomfort. But also the wild plum, as well as other similar fruits, were dangerous with their pips because in large quantities they became poisonous. In the past, when the protagonist was small, at the checkouts in stores often exhibited apricot pips. And once the girl thought it was candy and ate a couple of seeds. Her mother scolded the girl a lot after that because with a large amount of even the best medicine turned into poison. Although the girl was not going to eat a lot of them because in any case, the bones were not the most delicious delicacy. After the main procedures for processing plums were finished, they only remained to be thrown into a glass jar. So the adults began sorting and sorting, and the protagonist, looking at the already filled jars, rejoiced that everything came out perfectly. True, now this mixture needed to infuse for 100 days, which seemed a rather short time for the protagonist. But she was worried that Baikal would need her treatment and suffer from indigestion for those 100 days, she felt very sorry for the young man. But suddenly, Sophia remembered the magic that speeds up the fermentation process and suggested using it on the compote. As it turned out, fermentation instead of 100 days could take only a few hours. At least that's how it turned out every time in their past experiments. Charisse couldn't believe that it was that simple and that in just a few hours, she would be able to cure her foster father without having to wait that long. With these thoughts, she went to her room. And so, it had been several days since the compote had gone to fermentation. Waking up in the morning, the girl was playing with dragonflies the moment Sophia came in to check on her. When they chose an outfit and hairstyle together, the protagonist was ready to go out. She needed to go to breakfast. But the girl was still feeling anxious, thinking about her medicine every day. So, unable to bear it, she still asked Sophia how things were going. And the girl suggested going to the kitchen before breakfast. The staff was already waiting for them in the kitchen, who greeted the princess with joy, after which the woman servant began to look at the little girl, praising her for making her own medicine from apricots, and led her into the storage room. There, the girl noticed her long-awaited syrup, which looked just perfect, and there wasn't a drop of mold in it. So she was once again convinced of how handy magic was. After that, while giving her errands, Charisse asked her to strain and pour the syrup into a jar in order to ensure that there were no drains and only the liquid itself. And when everything was ready, she told the rules for storing this medicine and took a cup to pour it in. The maid tried to explain to the protagonist that this was not part of her duties, but the girl was determined to take this responsibility on herself, because in any case, the preparation of medicine was purely her idea. In the end, everyone was satisfied, and the maid, after saying a cheerful goodbye to the lady, wished her good luck and asked her to join the breakfast table as soon as possible. But as soon as she arrived at Baikal's office, it turned out that the man had gotten up very early in the morning and had already had breakfast and started his business. This really frightened the protagonist, who thought that her foster father had begun to avoid her. So she tried to think of what she should do. Jakal tried to explain to the girl that she shouldn't get so upset and worried about it. The Divine Prince always wakes up at dawn, at 4 a.m., after which he eats breakfast and does state business. And afterward, around dawn, he starts training with the other knights, in order to be their example and control them. The story really calmed the protagonist down, though she was worried about how diligent Bakel was. After all, it seemed as if he wasn't even bothered by his illnesses. But still, the protagonist continued to insist on her own and asked for the opportunity to meet her father while he was in training. After a bit of thought, Jakal realized that Baikal would be pleased with that as well, so he allowed it. When the protagonist arrived at the training center, there she caught a lot of knights, who, looking at the child, did not understand what she was doing here. And they were very awkward, 
because the knights were convinced that their company was not befitting a princess. But as soon as the girl awkwardly asked them to point out the office of the divine prince, her sweet face made the knights melt. So even stammering slightly, they showed her the way. But suddenly, the protagonist did not have time to make a couple of steps, as Bakel himself appeared, who with a smile warned the child that it was quite dangerous to be here alone, and asked her to tell why she came. The girl did not hesitate to throw herself into her father's arms, explaining that she missed him very much, which was the reason for her coming. Bakal was indeed pleased by these words, though he was surprised at his daughter's behavior, for they had seen each other only yesterday. The knights watching from the sidelines were amazed at the Lord's attitude towards his adopted daughter, for they had never seen him interact so warmly and sweetly with anyone, not even his first two children, though just from the princess's smile alone, they already thought the girl was too cute. So, in a way, they could understand the southern emperor's behavior. The girl pretended to be hurt by her father's words, for she thought that the man must also be bored, since he hadn't seen her since the morning. She also told him that she had brought him a present. This news especially pleased the man, who did not expect to receive something from the girl. And then she, smiling happily, asked Sophia for help, and the maid gave a small tea set, as well as a medicine for stomach pain. But suddenly the knights revolted and began to ask the princess for help, telling her that they also had a very bad stomach ache. But from the fierce look of Baikal, the knights immediately shook with fright and quickly shut up, not disturbing the little girl anymore. Then the three of them went to the southern emperor's workplace, where Sophia proudly told him that the medicine had been made entirely by the little princess, and in some points under her complete guidance. After the first sip, Bakel felt that the unpleasant sensations inside had indeed gone away. But the only thing he didn't like was that the princess happily started providing the medicine to the rest of the knights as well, who kept praising her, marveling at how she was able to create this drink. But she calmly explained to the knights that she brewed more of the medicine on purpose so that everyone could use it, and told them some recommendations to ease their condition so that they would feel better afterward. The emperor was very angry that the girl was giving away such precious compote made with her own hands, for he himself barely had enough of it, in spite of the fact that he had a huge supply in his storehouse. But suddenly, despite her busyness with the other patients, the protagonist noticed that the man reached for iced tea, and so she took away his cup, forbidding him to drink something like that because his pain could return. Initially, the man wanted to get angry as he usually did, but the girl reminded him too much of a kitten, so he could not feel any negativity towards her. At this point, the author wants to introduce us in more detail to the divine prince of the Castalia Empire, Baikal. It is known about the man that he had an excellent command of martial arts, as well as magic. He was a well-rounded handsome man, educated in different countries. But if we talk about his weaknesses, it is cats, which he loves very much. He never told anyone about such a thing, but he was a fervent cat person. Therefore, the princess who reminded him of a kitten seemed very cute to him. He especially disliked the fact that what he cared so much about was being noticed by others. After all, the knights did not hesitate to offer to ride the princess on his neck or in his arms, but she refused, explaining that she wanted to do such things only with her father. Despite her refusals, the emperor still thought that the princess liked this kind of attention though he wasn't sure of that, as he had no way of knowing what she was really thinking. Not wanting to be distracted further, Bakel called out to Sophia and asked that she take the child, as he and the rest of the knights all the time needed to continue their training, which was quite dangerous for her. The man himself, during the conversation between the princess and the maid, had been thinking about the books that Jakal had found for him on how to raise children properly. The man was too worried that he might do something wrong so he didn't want to rush and get too close to his daughter. But suddenly, Charisse came up and distracted him from his thoughts and asked him about the gifts that Bacall had prepared for her. Then she thanked him and ran away with a few last words. As it turned out, the girl came to her father and asked him to call her by her shortened name, which brought a smile to his face, for the child never ceased to amaze him. But as soon as the girl disappeared from the training ground, the man drew his sword and suggested that the knights return to their training and start by attacking him. At the same time, the protagonist got an alert that congratulated her on her completed task, as the Divine Prince's indigestion was completely cured. She received her payment of 10000 stones, 
which couldn't help but make her happy as her debt began to gradually decrease. Upon arriving back at the palace grounds, Sophia and the protagonist headed to the fourth floor, which the maid had previously told her about, and she was eager to pick out the best jewelry and clothing for the little lady. On the way, she explained how to get there and why this place became so reliable for storing everything important in this world. But unexpectedly along the way, the protagonist stopped in front of a portrait of a girl insanely resembling her appearance. Because of their unique resemblance, the little princess thought that the portrait was of her. But Sophia explained to her that the woman was actually the mother of the main character, whereupon she pushed the portrait slightly. And when the portrait pulled away from the wall, a secret room opened up. Already on the fourth floor, Sophia passed by the racks and told the girl about different gems, as well as about what great abilities the Divine Prince had, since he was able to create something like this. Rumor had it that even the Emperor couldn't do something like that, and so many people wondered why the man hadn't taken the lead in ruling the Empire yet. Though the protagonist herself suspected that a man might just be too lazy to take on such a responsibility. But suddenly the girl noticed a very beautiful crown, which she immediately liked, so she began to ask more about this jewelry. Then Sophia said that this jewelry was prepared for the mother of the main character as a gift, but never managed to get into her hands. The girl, looking at the rest of the jewelry, tried to understand why Baikal didn't give her these gifts after all. She didn't know the exact reasons, but she could tell with certainty that, judging by how beautiful the jewelry was, and even by the size of the tiara and its lightness, it was evidence of the brother's great love for the sister he cared for. It was obvious that the man had chosen each stone carefully in order to make sure that it would definitely please Kiana. And the protagonist wanted to know how her mom felt when she found out she had such a good brother. She wanted to have such a kind, reliable family, and she didn't even realize she'd said it out loud, which made Sophia sad, because she knew how hard the girl's life was. But to make her feel better, she said that the princess could choose anything she wanted on the floor. This surprised her, for all this jewelry didn't belong to her. But Sophia explained that it was unlikely that their prince would be angry if the only daughter of the lady, the younger princess, wore the jewelry. And Sophia was convinced that surely the prince would only be pleased. Then, after thinking about it, the girl realized that it sounded logical enough, so she agreed to accept the jewelry. Sophia suggested that she pick out everything she liked to take to her room later. Sophia also complimented the tiara the princess was wearing and suggested that she keep it on and continue to walk around with it. The main character was pleased with the compliment and the fact that she looked like a princess. But Sophia reminded that the girl was an aristocrat of imperial blood and by status had to wear something like that. After that, Sophia suggested the main character to go to the other floors because in the midnight palace of all sorts of outlandish things were just countless. The girl happily agreed. And then, on the way to the next places, Sophia expressed her desire to hire another maid for the young mistress, so that her life became even more comfortable, because she believed that such a child deserves to be treated better. So the week passed, and the rainy season began, and so the protagonist sat in her room. There she was, spoon-fed, while she lay quietly in bed and thought about the weather. Seeing such interest, Sophia immediately called her assistants and asked them to prepare the necessary clothes that would be warm enough. One of the girls wisely picked out comfortable warm shoes and things made of leather. This maid was new, but also belonged to the Everville clan, just like the second girl who had prepared clothes made of the most delicate fabrics containing magic. Looking at such worried girls, the protagonist immediately remembered their first meeting when they appeared a week ago at the manor. Sophia, after expressing her desire to hire more servants, soon introduced the protagonist to two girls who were able to pass the Everville family's strict selection process. Even the protagonist herself was amazed at how quickly Sophia was able to find the necessary candidates, but during their meeting, the girls were very much worried, which was noticeable. Then there was another task from the system. She needed to calm down two maids, for which she would receive a reward of 10 gems for each and the protagonist successfully completed this task. So after calming down, they began to rejoice together at how good a lady they were serving. But unfortunately, during their first acquaintance, the maids noticed that the protagonist had some kind of wound on her arm, because of which they were very worried. Then Charisse remembered that the wound left to her by Alexandra still hadn't healed, and for some reason it took a long time to heal, 
despite the fact that she had smeared her hand with a special ointment that was supposed to heal all wounds quickly. But this wound did not bother her now, although she realized that this story could be used to make the maids more interested in her. So, taking a specially healing cream, she turned to Hannah and asked that the girl anoint her hand and take care of it a little. Then, smiling happily, the girls began to help the princess, and they were clearly pleased that they felt needed. The protagonist's reminiscing stopped the moment Sophia came over with a list of literature. She suggested that the protagonist study a little while the rains were falling, in order to avoid getting sick. This list contained subjects that every member of the Castalian imperial family must learn. This included history from Mr. Leohad to the current ruler. All the princes and princesses would study this information and then proceed to their main studies afterward. And having to study didn't upset the girl at all because she knew that it would clearly help her pass this game more successfully and return home. So she agreed. Sophia was pleased that the young lady had such an interest in education and suggested that she start learning immediately. They began with the basics, which were to be taught before the age of five. But as was known, due to the protagonist's past, her maids were clearly not doing that. So Sophia promised that she would help the protagonist learn the basics quickly and deepen the knowledge she already had. For this purpose, she drew the family tree of the imperial family of Castalia. For a while, the protagonist still kept her concentration, but still the lessons seemed quite boring, so she began to get tired very quickly. Suddenly, what she saw made her cheer up very quickly though, so she jumped up from the couch, started pointing to the far corner of the room, and asking Sophia if she saw the same thing the protagonist herself had seen. It was a cat that had a strange magical aura emanating from it, and it seemed that other than the protagonist herself, no one else had seen it. Sophia, concerned about the princess's condition, suggested that she take a break, believing that the girl was overworked. And then, finally convinced that the maid did not suspect the presence of an unusual cat in the room, the protagonist pretended as if she had imagined something and offered to continue the lesson. Then, smiling, Sophia touched the magic crystal to start the recording. The protagonist realized that if she compared this to something similar in her world, it could be compared to recording some sort of video lecture, which was convenient. It was then that the girl began to talk in more detail about the empire. The empire was divided into a southern part and a northern part. The northern part was ruled by the emperor for over 100 years. He was the great-grandfather of the protagonist. After the emperor ascended the throne, all members of the imperial family were called the new generation, as opposed to the ancient generation. It consisted only of the direct descendants of the emperor, but all of this information was already well known to the protagonist. She knew the story of the absolute emperor who took possession of the dragon heart, and after his coronation, destroyed all his brothers and sisters. And his descendants were considered to be only those born from the second generation, that is, it was his own children who formed the current imperial family. And the main character became the younger sister of the dark mage of the imperial family. This was mentioned at the very beginning of the game. Depending on the names of his children, three factions were formed. They fought for power. This is all that was known to the protagonist. But suddenly, Sophia asked Cherise to concentrate, as there was a very important moment of the lecture, namely, she was going to tell whether the Emperor could continue to rule the Castalia Empire, and she also wanted to talk about the reason for dividing the country into two parts. The reason was because the Emperor wanted to give his descendants an equal chance. Any member of the Imperial family could try to gain power if they wished. Thus, he handed over the power over southern Castalia to the rest of the family. It was from that very moment that the struggle for power over the southern part began. But Charisse already had the impression as if the Emperor had purposely thrown all his heirs a decoy to strengthen his own position of power. But now the girl was finally convinced that there was no room for feelings or compassion in this game. As far as the protagonist remembered, among all 11 applicants for the place of the heir, she was the most unremarkable in this game. And the protagonist was originally a dark mage, so it was not strange. But suddenly the girl became curious about the fate of the members of the imperial family, whose surname did not contain the imperial affiliation. As it turned out, after the execution of 15 years, such people are expelled from the palace according to the system of exile. But the protagonist had never heard of something like this. It seemed to her that it was too terrible and hard, because if she was expelled, 
then the game would really be over. But Sophia, seeing the girl's worries, explained that there were differences between exile and banishment, because in exile, the heirs were given land and the title of count, which also had its advantages. Although the main character was not at all relieved, because during her stay in the game, she began to feel more similarity with her current life and became more attached to it, as if she would never return home. And that bothered her. So she wished she could solve all of her game's quests before she was cast out, and before she was lost in herself and her true identity. Though with each passing day, there was less and less certainty that she would basically be able to return. But right now, her goal was too far away to contemplate something like that. For now, she was still an orphan princess who was despised by everyone. Though in truth, the protagonist didn't really want to go back anymore, because if she went back, she would have nothing left. But suddenly she heard a strange voice. It was a voice from the public address system, so the protagonist was distracted by an unexpected sale. Sophia, seeing that the girl was losing concentration, decided to finish the lesson early. In addition, they had a visitor who looked at her with a too harsh look. Turning around, the protagonist noticed her father behind her, who praised the girl for being so focused on the lesson that she initially didn't even notice him. At that moment, the very same cat that had been sitting on the cabinet in the classroom the entire time jumped down from its seat and jumped onto the divine prince's shoulder after stretching a bit. The prince was not at all perturbed by the cat's behavior, and she concluded that it was the cat that belonged to him. Though something about this cat really confused her. And suddenly turning around, the man asked that the girl follow him as he wanted to show her something. She was worried that he was about to pack up her things and kick her out of the house, which would be the end of the game. So she started praying that it wouldn't happen, because that would be the worst ending to the story. No matter how much the protagonist asked to tell her where they were going, the man kept silent, which plunged her into a wild panic, because on Baikal's face it was impossible to predict what the man was thinking. In addition, her memories of the unexpected sale were flashing back to her. The protagonist had been thinking about whether she should buy something and had been putting it off because she was afraid she would be sent into exile. In that case, she would waste her stones and be left without a house. But in the end, having decided before the very entrance to the necessary place, the protagonist made the purchase. Next, the story sends us back in time, just at the moment when the protagonist received an alert from the system. Initially, the girl was surprised, thinking that a new task had come. But soon the notification was revealed. There, it offered her a way out if she was sent into exile in the midst of the battle for the throne. It was a special hint ticket while going through the game. A set of 10 hint tickets cost 1,000 stones, but the discounted price was only 99. Each ticket was a one-time use ticket. Initially, such a large discount confused the protagonist because it seemed to her that such a ticket could not be so cheap. Moreover, she was afraid that the same rabbit who had once sold her this complicated version of the game would bully her. After all, instead of working off her debts, she would be purchasing unnecessary items. And she was afraid that she might end up sinking down to slave instead of her debtor status because of the decisions she hadn't made. In addition, even after seemingly reading the notice, it kept flashing before her eyes, appearing in the most unexpected places and reminding her of herself. And because of this combination of factors, the protagonist decided to buy this set, hoping that these 10 attempts would help her avoid banishment from the palace. But instead of banishment, the protagonist saw that the room was furnished with expensive and beautifully wrapped gifts. And her father, smiling, was trying to find out if the girl liked them. As it turned out, in addition to the gifts, the man had completely changed the entire room, and the gift included everything inside. The man sincerely tried to make this room even more pretentious and beautiful, but he did not manage to make his dream a reality, as everyone opposed and recommended him to make a nursery that would correspond to the age of the princess. Then, looking around her and calmed down, the protagonist realized that this room was specially prepared for her by the Divine Prince and was completely engaged in its decoration himself. She had been so worried about the clues she had bought for nothing that she hadn't even paid attention to his efforts. So she, awkwardly and embarrassed, thanked the man and explained that she really liked the gift very much. She was very embarrassed by her reaction, but afterward she happily went to the boxes and began to look at them. In each gift, the girl saw that the man had carefully chosen all the gifts under her. And so, 
Looking at her father with gratitude in her eyes, she realized that this had happened to her for the first time, and such actions she could expect only in a dream. This convinced her that the prince really cared for her sincerely. She confessed that it was the first time she had ever received such a gift, and the man was glad that she liked everything, and that her efforts had not been in vain. Afterward, during the conversation, it turned out that the man even called the representatives of the Sistani family for help. They are one of the five great dukes, who are also called builders. But as it turned out, that wasn't the end of it. The man also called in the Taranese artists, who thought about the color scheme and decoration of the room, as well as paintings and even sculptors. All of them helped decorate the room and choose toys that would perfectly match the tastes of the protagonist. Then, unable to withstand such information, the girl knelt down and sincerely thanked the man for what he did for her. Such an action seemed strange to him, so she explained that it was the dragon's way of greeting. And that brought a smile to his face. Baikal stroked the protagonist's head and asked her not to thank him like that again, because he thought that the girl was worthy of even more, and asked her to use the room and everything inside of it properly. The protagonist could not understand why the man treated her like that, even though she was not his own daughter and was just a niece. But in any case, it suited her, and she would like to enjoy such a relationship as much as possible. The girl also decided to use the clues she had bought, but she needed to do it as inconspicuously as possible. So she pretended to do some drawing, and, calling up an additional window, began to deal with the terms of use of these hints. As it turned out, repeated views of the hint were impossible, and also the viewed hint disappears after 30 seconds. The main character guessed that for such a price, she would get so many conditions, so it did not surprise her, and she concentrated in order to memorize everything in detail. But what she saw really surprised her. The clue told her that once the game was over and during the restart, her entire balance would not be saved and she would have to start all over again. Even in the event that she manages to pay off her debt and dies, she will have to pay it off all over again. However, the special items stored in the user's treasure chest do not disappear. What the protagonist didn't realize is that if by special items they mean items related in any way to the game's system, then the item should most likely be located on Dragon Street. That was the place where all sorts of rarities and magic items were sold. But the items from there were too expensive, and the entrance fee there alone was 1,000 gems. Previously, when the protagonist was playing the game quietly, this location was also too expensive, so she had only been there a couple times. But the clue was generally useful for her, because she needs to be prepared for the unexpected ending of the game. And after that, she applied the next one. But unfortunately, it said that there were various penalties for not paying off the debt, and she already knew that. This clue was useless. She also got a few more hints she already knew, and finally found two more that looked more useful. There were several quest options in the game. Unexpected quests gave 1 to 10 million gems, and hidden quests gave hundreds to 900 million gems. The amount was determined randomly. Also, achievement rewards ranged from 100 million to 5 billion gems. The amount was also determined randomly. But unfortunately, the protagonist did not know how to buy additional episodes. On this for now, the girl decided to stop and not view anything else, as she was worried that when the problem started, she would not be able to use the clues. But at that very moment, Baikal came over to her, surprised that the girl had been sitting for so long without being able to draw anything. So she quickly had to come up with some excuse, and she firmly stated that she really wanted to draw her father, but she was worried that she might do something wrong, so she didn't dare. Besides, she thought he was too handsome, so she didn't know where best to start. Then the man calmed down and, smiling, sat down on his seat, asking the girl not to worry so much and just calmly draw in her own pleasure. It took a little more time for the protagonist to be in thought, after which she approached her father and began to ask about the twins. Charisse was very worried that the boys might not like it, and these words very surprised the young man, who did not understand why the protagonist was worried about it. But in fact, she realized that for these two guys, she was just an unknown child. Besides, all she knew about them was that they were the twin sons of His Highness, and Idris is as clever and shrewd as a sly fox, and in turn, Gerses is as strong and honest as a bear, but also quite naive. Therefore, he would probably be much easier to befriend. 
Because of this, the whole problem was with the first brother. Because even when playing games, he showed extraordinary intelligence. Because of this, it would be harder to be friends with him, for she would cause him to be constantly suspicious. Seeing his daughter's reflection and concern, Baikal explained that his older sons were not so infantile as to feud with his younger sister, and it was unlikely that they would pay attention to anyone but each other. So he convinces the girl that she can be at ease. The protagonist suddenly felt a great deal of care and warmth from this man, and realized that this could probably be considered a real parent and father. She hoped that if the man treated her in this way, he would actually want to adopt her someday. But she was afraid to ask about it directly because she didn't want to rush him into it somehow. But suddenly, Baikal was the first to speak of the subject. He wanted to know from the girl what an ideal father should be like. Then she remembered her life, namely how she had sat by the hospital bed as a child. All she remembered from that time was the smell of antiseptic and the sound of the pacemaker. Those were pretty much all the memories she had of her father. She also thought her father had smiled happily back then, but she wasn't sure of that anymore, as the events were too long ago. But anyway, the girl couldn't tell Baikal about it. So she just started to say what she thought was necessary. She wanted her father to braid her hair when he sat her on his lap, and to go shopping and to theme parks with her. Then, after hearing all this, Baikal was worried about how much a father should know and be able to do, he worried that he wouldn't be up to the role. This surprised the protagonist, for she knew that his sons had been brought up in really very harsh conditions. But seeing the man's efforts to really understand the subject, the protagonist decided to help him. She explained that the most important thing was that her father, no matter what, would always stay on her side. Even if she did something wrong, she wouldn't want her father to reprimand her or corner her in any way, but rather continue to stand by her side. The man, after thinking about it, took the girl in his arms and looked at her and explained that her worries were in vain because she was a princess. And everything a princess does is inherently right. Therefore, no one would dare to claim her. But the protagonist was worried that bad people like Alexandra would constantly meet bad people on her path and there would be no escaping such problems. But turning around, she saw that the man came to rage just from the mere mention and was already ready to commit some crime. But, seeing the fright on his daughter's face, he quickly calmed down, and going through her hair, braided her ponytail. This surprised the girl very much, and she realized that Baikal had done so because of her words about an ideal father. That was when Baikal calmly explained to Charisse that there was nothing in this empire that the girl couldn't have, and he also promised to be sure to build her a theme park if she wanted one. And he could swear that no one would ever dare to bully or mock her again, and he promised that he would not abandon her. But when the protagonist cried, he tried to distract her and asked her if she liked her hair. But Cherise couldn't calm down. She cried, because as it turned out, her father's love felt much warmer than she could have imagined. And, snuggling closer to the man, she explained that she loved the hair he'd braided and promised herself not to think about returning to her reality again. After all, she didn't want to leave the place where she had a family like that but soon it was time to leave. When Jakal arrived, he noticed a man who still had a sleeping baby in his arms and was reading a book. The aide explained that Baikal needed to go through these very important documents and the matter was indeed urgent. But the man was not about to let go of the child who had fallen asleep in his arms while crying. Then Jakal turned his attention to the books the man was reading and realized that in all probability he had mixed up something as they were works of fiction. But his musings were interrupted by the awakened protagonist, who looked at her father sleepily, explaining that she had woken up as soon as she heard Bakel's voice, and asked what was going on. Then, when the man explained that he needed to work, Jakal praised him for setting a good example for the child, and also the aide noticed how much the prince had changed since the girl had come to this palace. The girl, in his opinion, was a very kind, intelligent, and bright child. In addition, she was also very cute, Therefore, everyone around him felt as if a flower had bloomed in the palace. The girl was very embarrassed to hear such a thing because she had not done anything outstanding. She felt like Jakal was trying to flatter her, but Baikal reminded the girl that Jakal was absolutely right, after which he smiled and left the office. Such a smile Jakal hadn't seen in a very long time, which surprised him. It was obvious that spending time with the princess was clearly having a good effect on the man. 
Then Jackal immediately told him how things were going with the adoption process. Everything was going quite well, and it was already possible to have an adoption party as soon as the two princes returned. A letter had recently arrived from them saying that they had passed their exams early and left, but the prince urged especially not to worry, as they are not the kind of people that anything can happen to. He also shared the news about preparing the plum trees with magic, as it was a medicine prepared by the protagonist. It seemed appropriate for Jakal to make this tree a themed decoration. Baikal also liked it, and asked that Jakal personally oversee the preparations to make sure everything was perfect. Smiling, the aide agreed, wondering what was now happening outside the palace. The first rumors of adoption had already started to appear there, and it was hard for people to believe that the man had made such a decision and was in his right mind. Since all they had heard about the princess was that this girl who can't even talk just quietly existed. But this decision was also liked by some people, because they thought that the divine prince was very noble since he decided to adopt this child. But suddenly, one of the boys on the street told a new rumor that this girl was actually blessed by the dragon himself and that she was smart enough to make medicine out of poison at that age. Then came new theories that she was actually hiding her talents and was only using them to save her life. Then another faction began to be discussed, one that Alexandra belonged to. It was Jen's faction, and it was the main one among the Imperial families. After that, everyone around started whispering about the punishment that the representative of the family received. And also, people were thinking that perhaps when Princess Charisse became of age, she could be a candidate for the throne. As a result of all these conversations, the people became even more interested in finding out who this princess was and what she was, for she was still a completely unknown exhibit to them. At this time, a little girl engaged in playing in the garden began to sneeze violently because of how much was being talked about her. The gardener, after wishing her good health, began to laugh happily, marveling at how few members of the royal family were interested in gardening, which surprised him greatly. But the girl was happy, as she had already managed to fill her basket with the medicinal herbs she needed. The gardener was not surprised that the girl had found everything she needed. But she knew that even though the center and sides of the garden were planted with ornamental flowers, not all the flowers were only aesthetically beautiful. There were also flowers, trees, and medicinal herbs. The protagonist realized that she was very lucky to have the garden the way it was. After all, no matter what quest in the future, if it was related to medicine, she would easily be able to pass it. After all, there were flowers and all sorts of plants here that were not much different from the plants in the apothecary store. Everything she needed could be found here. The gardener also warned the princess about the danger of small rodents or snakes hiding in the grass. Even though the princess could be cured anyway if something bad happened, the gardener did not want to allow such a moment to happen. And then, listening to his words, the protagonist thought for the first time about the level of medicine in this world. During the game, she had no need to go to a doctor even once, and so she never received treatment here. But it was different with the common people. Even the powerful ones like the imperial family could get hurt during their work. Furthermore, if the commoners hurt themselves and left their wounds unattended, it could end very badly for their health. Therefore, they definitely needed a qualified doctor. Seeing the girl's curiosity about medicine, the gardener told her that he himself usually went to the medicine room in the palace. The servants from the palace just use the medicines from the medicine cabinet. The rest of the people who do not reside in the palace most likely go to the temple where medicines are sold and get the necessary treatment there. It was then obvious that the belief in the gods here was very deep. At least, they often turn to the goddess of faith and love for help, because this goddess among all the gods of the religion of the empire was the most symbolic, very kind, and helping all those in need. In addition, the status of her temple was very high, and the temple is considered the only force capable of opposing the imperial family. The main character was not surprised that, despite her experience in the game, she first learned that the temple even sold medicines and wanted to know how much such a pleasure costs. But as it turned out, the price of medicine started from 10,000 coins. The girl could not believe that this was a real sum, because a rich family of average means could live on this money for a month. There was also a problem with doctors, so it was difficult to get treatment from them, because there were fewer doctors than priests. And you couldn't even get to see a doctor unless you waited an approximate amount of time. 
And the situation in each temple with that time was different, but you had to be prepared to wait at least a year. This seemed like an unbelievable thing to the protagonist. She didn't understand what to do if the disease worsens and there's no time left. After all, the most important thing in an illness is time, which can save a life. So most likely a huge number of people could have died because of it, just because of the waiting. But as it turns out, there were definitely ways that you can meet the doctor earlier. But in order to do so, you have to donate a large amount of money and move up in the waiting list for treatment. Then the protagonist realized how sad everything really was. After all, in this case, the order of treatment for the inhabitants of the empire was determined not by the urgency and severity of their condition, but by money. Those who have money receive treatment and those who do not have it after a long wait eventually die. Then the protagonist remembered that she had once been on a quest in a game with a grandmother. The woman explained that the place where she heals people didn't have enough healing herbs, and so in return for the protagonist's help, she could offer loyalty and become her spy. It was a short quest, which was why the task sounded so simple, and the protagonist, after some more thought, began to understand it. It seemed that this man was in a way replacing people's doctor by helping them, but because the woman didn't have a license that confirmed her right to treat other people, it was likely that the woman was actually treating others illegally. On the one hand, it was right that people who had licenses had the right to treat. But on the other hand, if people don't know if they can get to a doctor, even by diligently collecting money, you can't condemn the fact that they don't mind going to a witch doctor. And in the end, it seemed like a logical idea for the protagonist to do her best to give ordinary people access to medicine. But she wished she had thought of it much earlier, during her many games. The gardener, seeing the girl's worries, was glad that the young princess was so much interested in the difficulties of the needy, but asked her not to worry, because their empire was under the patronage of the goddess who destroyed everything bad. And the goddess had mercy on people who prayed and strengthened their faith in times of illness. But the protagonist knew that it worked in a completely different way. After all, only if people were treated properly, not with prayers, could they recover without relying on the goddess's mercy. In any case, the princess still had a lot of work ahead of her. She didn't know where to start already or how to proceed. At the very least, there were two major problems in this country. The first was the low accessibility to medicine for the common people, and the second was that the level of medical knowledge was also quite low. Despite the fact that medicine was so rare, the protagonist knew that such details were simply a peculiarity of the genre because the game was a romance fantasy genre, where the actions unfolded in the Middle Ages. But no matter how fictional the game was, there was still a caste system. Therefore, the main character needed to develop a detailed plan before opening her pharmaceutical shop. But the girl was afraid of the problems that arose, such as the fear of the people around her and the distrust of people. Also, the protagonist remembered the clues she had recently used and that there were several kinds of quests. She hadn't done the achievement quest yet, but she suspected that this class would probably have something to do with the original game story, because there was even a mission in the original game that required her to stop the end of the world. And the protagonist never knew when the story quest would go beyond level 20. So she needed to increase the availability of medicine so that the common people wouldn't feel burdened. But suddenly, someone called out to her. When she turned around, she saw a little boy. Smiling, he rebuked the protagonist for her insolence and calling her an idiot, demanded an explanation as to why she had such an arrogant face all the time. But the protagonist, calmly continuing to eat an apple, asked this stranger to introduce himself and tell who he was. This ignorance made him very angry, but he smiled and explained that, unlike her, he was a universally recognized prince. His name was Ashvi Jen Castalia. The protagonist grudgingly thought about how this boy was too pompous, like for a kid who came out in an add-on game. After all, if he was part of the main story, she would definitely have heard or known at least something about him. But more importantly, they were now in the garden of the Midnight Palace. So the girl wondered how the boy had the audacity to come into her house and start bossing her around. It annoyed her. So she had the idea to simply avoid him and ignore him. But based on the character of this prince, which was obvious to everyone, he would probably start telling others how she ran away in fear from him. And such an option also made her very unhappy. Therefore, the protagonist, madly angry that such a guy dared to put her in such a predicament, 
decided to seriously talk to him about her rightness. The guy advised her to confess that she was scared, otherwise his dragon heart would tear the girl apart. But instead, she kicked the tree, right where the young prince had stood before, and demanded him to explain who was really scared here. Because that role clearly didn't belong to her. Then, angry at the protagonist, the prince pushed her away and reminded her that he wanted nothing to do with such a vulgar princess, who was very much like her mother. But then, seriously furious, the protagonist demanded any apology for the fact that he dared to talk about her mother in such a way, and threatened him with punishment. The boy was confused because he didn't understand what had happened to the child, who was widely known as an idiot who can't even speak. But because of fear, the prince could not think of anything better than to try to intimidate Charisse with Alexandra's name, and reminded him that his sister would obviously not leave such an act unpunished. This only amused the protagonist, because the guy really believed that Alexandra had some power. And this was indeed true, until the moment when His Highness took her from this house to the palace. Therefore, she grinningly asked if the guy knew about the red medicine. It is a bright red-colored medicine that kills a person if you drop it on a wound. She promised that she would inflict the wound on him, and afterwards, she would make sure to use the red medicine on the boy by pouring more of it on the wound. And she ordered him, in order to avoid it, to leave her garden at once, and to make sure that he would never be here again. The boy was indeed frightened, seeing the uncontrollable fury in the eyes of the princess, and so, rising to his feet, quickly fled. The protagonist, left alone, felt much calmer, and rejoiced that she was able to frighten this pompous prince, and showed that her family cannot be treated negligently. After that, she decided to warn her father that the ugly man had come here. But this whole picture was watched from on high by the maids, who perfectly saw how the protagonist began to beat and intimidate the guy. And this girl made a bad impression on them, and so they considered her much better than she had seemed to them before. The twins weren't sure if they should get involved in this whole situation. Besides, they really didn't want their father to find out about them hiding here. But Idsit said that they needed to intervene in order to somehow get the protagonist talking, since they had already heard that she was able to make a cure out of wild plum. And it was obvious to Idsit that if he took the girl to her grandfather, she could probably cure him. At the very least, he wanted to give her the opportunity to do something like that. Plus, if it went well, they could earn extra points. And if not, the girl wouldn't be scolded since she was only four years old. But Gersi didn't know how they could help the protagonist now, since she had already chased that kid away herself. But Idsit said that was not enough, as he must pay for bullying their family. At that time, the boy ran away from the garden, realizing that he needed Alexandra's help, because once she appeared, Charisse would not even be able to say a word against them. He was determined to definitely repay her. But at that moment, he heard the voice of Hersey, who was very curious as to where the boy was in such a hurry. The voice immediately sent a shiver through his body. Then he saw Gersik himself, who activated his spell and strengthened the force field around him, preventing the boy from getting through. Gersik was clearly displeased that someone dared to entertain on their domain. The obviously frightened prince began to make excuses immediately, explaining that there had been a misunderstanding and he was just passing by. But Idsit, who appeared as if from nowhere, asked the boy not to lie so brazenly, because they had seen everything and knew what he was doing here. The frightened boy immediately realized that this was a huge trouble, because despite the fact that Gersik frightened him very much, it was better to get a few blows from him than to mess with Idsit. At this time, the smiling Idsit asked, as the boy made some excuse for himself, and also thought about what was going to happen to him. A frightened Ashvi thought of nothing better than to fall to his knees and start begging for forgiveness from the two young gentlemen. He explained that he hadn't even realized they were on the estate and promised that he wouldn't behave like that again. Looking at the boy, the brothers looked at each other and decided his fate. Idsit decided to let him go for the first time, to show his leniency. But he reminded the boy of his words, namely that Ashvi did not know the brothers were here. It seemed an insincere apology to him, for in that case, if he knew they were definitely not here, he would continue to insult their family and for the family's honor, he was willing to go to the end. As a result, the forest near the estate was filled with the prince's screams, and soon everything became quiet. At that moment, the protagonist who came to Baikal told about what happened, and the prince praised her for the fact that the girl scolded this guy who doesn't know manners. 
During this whole story, the protagonist ate delicious desserts and the man braided her pigtails. The girl was amazed that the man seemed to be seriously practicing to make his hair come out very well, and she appreciated that. But suddenly, before going outside, the protagonist noticed the stack of papers on Bakel's desk and realized that, most likely, while she was playing, His Highness and his assistants were attending to these matters. Then that completely explained why the faces of all the young man's aides looked so tired. They couldn't even compare to the knights from the training ground. Therefore, in order to help them out a little, the protagonist decided to stay together with her father. At the very least, she could help them relieve their fatigue like the knights, and that would allow her to get extra points. So she went to the helpers and explained that she wanted to make something like plum fruit tea for them. Out of joy, the servants couldn't believe they were surrounded by such an incredibly caring princess. They made the girl comfortable and gave her a sketchbook so she could keep her notes on the recipe. The protagonist even felt embarrassed that her father's helpers liked her so much, but she decided to try and figure out what medicine would work best for them. But suddenly she was distracted when she saw that very cat again. Since the cat in the house was not far from his highness, the girl assumed it was his pet after all. Especially when the man was working at his desk, he paid absolutely no attention to that kitten. For some reason, at one look at this strange magical animal in the main character's mind, recalled memories with that rabbit and it began to bother her. So she drew a rough picture of the cat and gave the drawing to her father, wondering who the animal was. Then Bakal, becoming much more serious, asked the girl if she had ever seen this animal. The protagonist was very excited by this question, for it sounded as if she should not have seen this creature, but she had absolutely seen it, so it wasn't a lie. Then, after a bit of thinking and snapping his fingers, the man placed his cat back to her, which really startled the protagonist. Bakal then explained that he was a bit surprised, as normally people can't see familiars. He then introduced the main character to his familiar. This cat's name was Mile. Then the protagonist wondered for what reason the cat could not be seen by everyone else. As it turned out, this mysterious cat could not be seen by anyone, and the protagonist became a surprising exception in this regard. In order to see the familiar, one had to have innate conditions. At the very least, one had to possess the power of a half-dragon, a rare gift that was only allowed to the most powerful members of the imperial family. It was a specialty of familiars. The protagonist wondered what this mysterious half-dragon power meant, for she was the weakest of the weak, and it was strange that she could see this amazing beast, but at the same time, she felt like she couldn't possess her own familiar so it was probably some sort of glitch due to her miraculous transport from another world. Seeing her deep thoughtfulness, Bakal affectionately recommended that the girl not worry about it so much. He knew that the protagonist was a very special princess who had received the blessing of a dragon, and apparently she was also worthy of being chosen by some powerful familiar. Plus, as it turned out, the twins Idsit and Hersey already had their own familiars that they could happily show to the protagonist if she wanted. The girl had heard a similar story about how she also had a familiar at birth, but for some mysterious reason he became disillusioned with her and ran away. Also, in her past life, Charisse was indeed a strange child, very distant from the others. So most likely she didn't know anything about familiars and just couldn't recognize him in time. But the main thing that was pleasing was that at the very least, Bakel was not disappointed with her and, on the contrary, was genuinely happy about her progress. Thinking about familiars, the girl suddenly remembered the mysterious rabbit she had seen on her first day here. She hypothesized that it could also be someone's familiars. Therefore, she asked her father if he had seen His Majesty the Emperor's surname by any chance. As it turned out, no one had seen it, as the Emperor had carefully hidden his surname from other people's prying eyes. The protagonist was very surprised by this, but did not show it. The girl was convinced that if in this magical world, there was someone strong enough to move her from another world, it could not be anyone else but the emperor himself. But the girl didn't know what she should do if this mysterious rabbit really turned out to be the emperor's familiars. She couldn't directly ask this formidable man why he had brought her here, but in any case, it seemed impossible to her, because no matter how powerful the emperor was, he was still just a character in a game. She had probably thought too much about such nonsense and started to fantasize about it, because the characters in the game couldn't do such incredible things. They can't interfere with reality after all. But suddenly she heard some suspicious noise, 
When the girl turned to see that the maid confusedly sits on the floor near the shards of the broken teapot, she awkwardly began to apologize and promised to remove everything now. But the protagonist calmly explained that everything was fine and asked the girl not to worry so much about it because the kettle, it's just a utensil. But suddenly, looking at her hands, she was horrified to see that they were covered with numerous wounds and scratches. Then the maid looked down and said that during yesterday's cleaning, she had been rubbing the antique candlesticks with the other maids, and apparently she had gotten a rash from the contact with the iron. Then the protagonist, putting all the facts she heard together, realized that she must have had an allergic reaction to the metal. Such an unpleasant allergy usually occurs when touching a metal containing nickel. So, most likely, the girl's delicate hands were badly hurt, but she just didn't pay proper attention to it. The maid assured her that very soon the allergy will pass by itself and everything will be fine. But the princess saw that the poor girl's hands were itching and causing her a lot of discomfort. So she began to think feverishly about where she could get antihistamine medicine, although there was hardly anything like that in this world. But suddenly she remembered the healing ointment she herself had applied to the wounds left to her earlier by the wily Alexandra. So she reminded the maid of this miraculous potion, and then quickly rushed to run down the corridor to get this magic ointment. But Bakel stopped the girl, asking her to calm down a bit. He tried to explain that the things of the imperial family could not be so easily given away, especially if it was a gift from the temple, blessed by the high priestess herself, especially since it was an immutable imperial law. But the protagonist was not going to back down. She was firmly convinced that this marvelous ointment would definitely help the maid to heal. The awkward girl explained that there was nothing wrong with her, and she also had good medicines, after which she demonstrated what she had. But the princess was horrified, for the cream looked stale and it gave off a strange, unpleasant odor. Even the smell of rot would be better than this stench. Looking at the suspicious ointment, the protagonist asked the girl to remember the date of purchase of this dubious potion. As it turned out, the ointment had been bought about 10 years ago, when the maid had just joined the Everville family. And she decided to buy it because the ointment was supposedly of high quality, with a high poppy content. Upon hearing this shocking date, Charisse was horrified. After all, the medication had long since expired, though it was unlikely that the locals had a similar understanding. Besides, she thought about the ingredients, namely the poppy. It was a plant with beautiful, delicate flowers, but unfortunately it was often used for other, much less noble purposes. Poppies were used to make illegal substances, especially opium, which was highly addictive. So she couldn't believe that something like that was being applied to wounds here because it would have terrible, irreparable consequences. But still, the girl ordered herself to calm down and not worry so much, for she knew that in the past, poppies had indeed been used as medicine, and because of the stupefying effect, it also had strong painkilling properties, which was obvious. But it was much better to make medicines from safer flowers, such as the delicate calendula. And she had heard that such medicinal plants were also in the greenhouse of this palace. Be that as it may, the protagonist was unwilling to stay away and warned the maid that she need not use that horrible ointment anymore because it was already unusable. But the girl objected, saying that according to her mother, all medicines have only gotten better over the years. And then, the frightened protagonist realized that, apparently, all the people of the Empire were very much mistaken in this matter. And she didn't even know where to start explaining such simple but important things, and to a huge number of people. But suddenly, she saw a notification window that informed her that a new episode was coming. She needed to solve the problem of the low level of medicine in the Empire and she could open this episode for 999 crystals. The protagonist was a bit disappointed that even though it was important to develop medicine, she needed to invest her own money in order to make any difference in this imperfect world. It seemed unfair and blatantly wrong to her. At this point, seeing the protagonist's confusion, her father calmed her down and promised that he would definitely contact the medical department and ask them to develop a better solution for the maid's wounds. The unhappy girl immediately cried, believing that she was to be removed from her position. She promised that she would not cause any more trouble or complain anymore, willing to do anything to remain the maid of the princess she liked so much. But the emperor, 
smiling softly, reminded the girl that she had broken the teapot near the child, and the sharp shards could hurt her. So he wanted her to take a break and get some rest, so that it wouldn't happen again from now on. Then, having sent the maid to rest, the man suggested that the protagonist go outside and take a walk, as the weather was nice and sunny. But the girl, not wanting to part with her beloved father, wanted to stay with him. Besides, she had come to come up with a recipe for energy supplements while she watched the assistants at work. But Baikal, stroking his daughter's head affectionately, explained that it was too noisy now and they wouldn't be able to have a good time anyway, and it would get even more boring as time went on. Agreeing then, the girl left the room so as not to be inconvenienced and began to think about what she should do. It bothered her that the notice above her head still hadn't disappeared, as if forcing her to make a payment. The protagonist realized that the price was too high, and if it was even a little lower, she would have invested the money without a second thought to provide the empire with better medicines. Then, as if hearing her thoughts, the menu began to dive and loaded a new price already, namely 998 crystals. This made Charisse even angrier, so as she walked away, she refused to buy such an episode. But, to her surprise, the price began to decrease sharply and drop to 900 crystals. This alerted the girl. Obviously, the system was important that this episode was passed. Then, after some thought, the protagonist decided to buy the episode for 900 crystals. She was worried that there might not be any further price reductions. Besides, she felt that it was enough payment to help her faithful maid, as well as the rest of the people who were suffering from similar delusions. When the transaction was complete, her assignment uploaded. The system alerted her that the ointment the maid was using was very expensive, but its effects were minimal. And there were 93,000 other people in the empire using the same ointment. Therefore, she needed to make a new ointment and also mass distribute it to all those 93,000 people. The reward for each of these two tasks was 100 million crystals, but if you failed, the game would be over. The time to complete was 2160 hours. It was an achievement quest, but the protagonist, despite really wanting a similar quest, couldn't believe that it was possible. After all, producing ointment for more than 90000 people was unbelievable. With a simple mathematical calculation, she found out that she had exactly three months. And in that time, she would have to search the whole country, find people using poppy seed ointment, replace it with a new one, and she could not even imagine how much such a thing would cost. The protagonist woke up tired, because all night she had been thinking about her new, incredibly difficult task. She was thinking about the formula for a new ointment, and decided to make it from calendula. Only by changing the formula she wanted to put calendula in the oil, she knew that this plant was originally used as a medicine to treat blisters or skin lesions, as it was perfect for making healing ointments. But the problem was that it would take a whole month just to make calendula-based oil. To get a full-fledged medicine also took time. And of course it takes time to replace the old ointment with a new one for about 93,000 people. And the time to do so was far too short. It seemed to her that it was an absolutely impossible task for a four-year-old child to find that many people in the remaining two months. Even if she was a member of the royal dynasty, everything had to have some limits. But suddenly, Sophia came in, marveling at how early the young mistress was up. She came to call the princess for breakfast. While Sophia was looking for the things she needed, she noticed how upset the princess looked, and thought it had something to do with the maid and her wounds. But Sophia hugged the girl affectionately and calmed Charisse down, explaining that thanks to Baikal, the maid had been given the best treatment. And after the end of the treatment, she would be suspended from work where it was possible to get poisoned by metals. This news made the main character very happy, and Sophia was happy that their little mistress was so concerned about everyone around her. Besides, she was well aware of the fact that very soon the princess's two older brothers would be returning home. When all the preparations were ready, Sophia and Charisse walked out into the main hall, where a procession was already standing to greet the young gentleman. The hall was decorated with lush floral arrangements and sparkling garlands, and the servants in ceremonial livery were frozen in respectful bows. The protagonist's heart beat faster with excitement and anticipation. She knew that the meeting with her brothers would be a serious test for her, because she had to make the best impression on them and prove that she was worthy to be a part of their family. 
The protagonist was very worried about her appearance and wanted to look the right way. The two princes, Idsit and Hersi, finally showed up and went straight to her father. Bowing respectfully, they greeted Prince Baikal. Then, after carefully looking over the stately lads, the man decided to introduce his sons to their new sister. The brothers immediately greeted the protagonist, with Idsit acting more friendly and Hersi treating her more warily. The protagonist didn't know what tactics to use, so she decided to show her sweet side and make the brothers her allies. But when she greeted them cheerfully, for some reason the guys didn't like it. Hersi just grudgingly grimaced, and Idsit assumed that something was wrong with their sister's head, since she was acting like that when they first met. He moved closer and asked her to explain what she was hoping for by behaving in such a manner. The protagonist had expected something like this from the shrewd Idsit, for the boy had already been able to realize in such a short time that she was being nice on purpose. But afterward, smiling enigmatically, he stroked the girl's head and pretended that all was well between them. Gersi, who was watching from the side, had absolutely no idea what his cunning brother was up to, so he tried to learn from him what had suddenly happened to his mood. Baikal, watching them closely, requested that the sons find some time to spend with the protagonist. The adorable girl needed time to bond with her brothers. Idsit asked his father not to worry, for he already understood what Baikal wanted the best for the adopted girl. He promised that he and his brother would definitely take responsibility and take care of their little sister. After that, he approached the protagonist who was hugging Hersey and suggested that they go to the secret base to talk. But the protagonist hadn't heard of anything like that, so the boys with a mysterious look told her that they had a secret base that the adults didn't know about, and it was a kind of their secret hideout. Afterwards, taking the girl by the hand, Idsit led her further. He warned that this place was very secret and they didn't bring anyone there. A spell shimmered around them, and grabbing her hand tightly, Hersey pulled her along. That's how they got inside. But unfortunately, the protagonist had a very hard time with this magical displacement, and she was very dizzy. Watching this guys immediately realized that the girl was quite weak, so they decided to behave more carefully with her in the future. Eventually, when the protagonist calmed down, they all sat down at the table, and Idsit, apologizing for such a sudden conversation, explained that they had come here to ask for something. Since they had already heard about the girl making medicine from plums, and they also knew that this medicine had actually worked and took away indigestion as well as helped relieve the knight's fatigue, the boys wanted to secretly ask something of the main heroine. It was to remain their secret as they wanted to help their grandfather, whose condition was very bad. This news surprised the protagonist because it was about Emperor Lycord himself. Although, remembering his venerable age of over 200 years, the protagonist realized that health problems at that age were very obvious despite his youthful appearance. Idsit wanted to offer the protagonist a rather favorable deal because he knew very well that Charisse had many enemies in the Imperial Palace. At the very least, it was Alexandra who could not stand the girl, as well as her younger brother, with whom they had disagreements. In addition, for most of Jen's family, Charisse was an eyesore that only hindered and annoyed them. It was very disadvantageous for the protagonist to be all alone in their midst. But if Idsit and Hersey were around her, she would be treated very differently. So Idsit offered her protection if she would help her solve the problem. For the mere help, the protagonist would forever have the strongest allies to protect her. After thinking a bit, the protagonist realized that if this was going to be another quest, the system would definitely help her with her choice of treatment. So it wouldn't be that hard. At least this quest isn't as difficult as the achievement quest. Besides, if she earns the fame of being the beneficent granddaughter who cured the emperor's illness, then she could get a higher position in the palace. But seeing the girl's agitated musings, Hersey calmed her down and explained that she must not agree to their terms against her will. He also warned that she would lose nothing if she even tried to help. After all, she was only four years old, so no one would blame her if she failed. Then he gave Idsit a grudging look and asked the boy to be careful what he said, because he wanted too much from their four-year-old sister. Despite her brightness, she was still a child. Once again reminding her that she could refuse, the good-hearted Hersey explained that they weren't bad enough to punish her for refusing. Smiling, the protagonist realized that her expectations for Gersik had come true, for he was literally the embodiment of justice. And so, with the boy on her side, she could always rely on him. 
But still, she wanted to know the details, so she asked Idsit what kind of symptoms her grandfather was experiencing. As it turned out, the boy hadn't seen anything himself, but from what he had heard, the emperor had red spots on his skin, itching and burning. He was also constantly aching and dizzy. In addition, there was something wrong with his stomach, though it was definitely not indigestion, but something else. Then, after a bit of thinking and putting all the symptoms together, the protagonist began to guess what might have happened to him. It was very similar to typical allergy symptoms. So Charisse immediately asked if the emperor had tried drinking something like holy water that cured any illness. But as it turned out, it was useless. Since the emperor's dragon power was too great, such water didn't work on him. Then the protagonist realized that the highest priority now was to find out what exactly the emperor was allergic to. She assumed it could be bee stings, though she realized that such a thing was unlikely to harm the strongest man in the world with the power of a dragon. She also speculated dust or wool, for perhaps there was something of the sort in the emperor's quarters. Or it could be food allergies, so she asked that the boys remember what grandfather had eaten in the past few days. As it turned out, the emperor's secretaries keep records, but unfortunately, this kind of information is not easy for anyone to get their hands on. After all, something terrible could happen if the information was leaked. After some more thought, the protagonist realized that most likely it was indeed a reaction to some food. Therefore, she needed to completely check the man's diet. Then, upon hearing the girl's suggestion, Idsit explained that he had one way he could get that data. He could bribe the secretary of the grandfather at the bottom of the Shintaburi and find out all the necessary information from him. The main character thought about the name the guy said, but had no way of knowing where she had heard it. But after she finally remembered that this is the event, which about 50 years ago led the emperor. To understand the importance of this event, it is necessary to know that the emperor was a passionate fan of collecting, who collected everything, even if he himself did not use such things. Therefore, he always had expensive herbs, mushrooms, and elixirs in his arsenal. And people who wanted to attract the attention of the collector emperor spent a whole year collecting all sorts of rarities and waiting for the one and only day of the year when they could see the emperor in person, despite his high status. Therefore, this day was almost like a real holiday. Idsit explained that Shintaburi Day would come after the Harvest Festival, which was about a month later. There would be an almost festive atmosphere on that day, so everyone would be quite relaxed, and there was no better time to get the information they needed. But the protagonist realized that events were moving too fast. After all, she had another very important task, and she did not yet know how long it would take her to complete the calendula ointment. But after doing some math, she realized that it might take just about a month. And in that case, she would have time to make the ointment. If this ointment was good for the emperor's health, he would definitely take it. And then the ointment will gain popularity, and people will start talking about it. It will also become a rather desirable product, after which the protagonist will announce that she is going to distribute this ointment to ordinary people for free. And they will definitely take the bait. And for the Imperial Palace, it would be a great opportunity to raise its reputation higher than that of the temple. But in the end, the new medicine, tested by the Emperor himself, would spread among the people. Naturally, it would become a substitute for poppy ointment for humans as well. And so, the girl would be able to complete her quest and also gain loyal allies. Therefore, this was a great chance for her to realize all her goals. The sudden thoughtfulness of the girl was also noticed by Idsit, who immediately paid attention to it. Therefore, the protagonist had to justify that she was pondering about the Emperor's illness. She didn't want anyone to know about her real plans, but she wondered just how strong the Emperor's allergies were. After all, the stronger it was, the faster some kind of action needed to be taken. But even the problem was that even if she said she could cure the Emperor, it was unlikely that anyone would believe a four-year-old child. So there was nothing left for her but to wait for that fateful day to start acting clandestinely. Looking at her pensive expression, Idsit realized that most likely the girl had too many thoughts. So, as a reward, he generously offered to let her choose some other privilege that she would get if she helped them. In fact, Idsit had expected the protagonist to refuse right away, so he was very touched that she agreed so quickly and he was ready to give her anything as a thank you. The girl couldn't believe that she could actually decide to get anything as a gift, no matter what it would be. 
and she really did have a thing she longed for. When she told Idsit about it, he only smiled enigmatically and nodded his head. He asked her to tell him what it was, and then, upon reflection, the protagonist realized that at the moment, she had nothing more desirable than one single thing. The story then sends us into the next day. The protagonist came to the owner of the storehouse and asked her for sunflower oil. She needed a lot of it, so that she could fill a whole huge container. Then the woman, smiling affectionately, realized that, most likely, the protagonist was going to make a miracle cure again and was sincerely delighted with the clever little girl. Then, looking around, the protagonist was surprised to see that everyone in the kitchen was still drinking her miracle syrup from plums, marveling at its marvelous taste and healing effect. This could not have been more gratifying. She knew how hard the cook's jobs were, as they tasted a lot of spices while working in the kitchen, which could cause them to have stomach bloating problems. And her potion could alleviate their suffering, because in any case, all these people were working hard every day for her and her family. When the kind woman found the necessary container, the protagonist had already clutched at it to carry it away. But, seeing that this is an impossible task for a fragile child, the woman offered her help. And, taking the container, they went together to the backyard. When everything was ready, the protagonist looked at the garden and marveled at how good the weather was today to prepare the medicine. After that, she went to pick marigold flowers. But when she came to the bed, she was surprised to see that the flowers were of different sizes. Some were too small and some were too big. But then, her familiar gardener appeared with a whole bunch of fresh marigolds. The protagonist was amazed at how much the man had managed to collect in such a short period of time. But the gardener proudly reminded of his professionalism and years of experience. Other gardeners also came to them and began to call the protagonist to her, showing her where the best flowers grew and wanting to get her attention. The girl was very embarrassed that so many people wanted to help her, although she was immensely grateful. But here, the head gardener was very angry with these guys. He thought that they were trying to shirk their work in this way, and sternly explained that with such irresponsibility, they would never become real palace gardeners. The young gardeners tried to explain that they had no such bad aims. All they wanted was to repay the princess for the favor she had shown them by treating them to her wonderful healing syrup. But the grumpy grandfather gardener was not satisfied with this, so he threateningly ordered the boys to get back to work quickly. After that, the whole garden was filled with his unhappy shouts. When everything was over, the two of them were already calmly returning to the place where a large container stood in the backyard of the palace. The gardener was very embarrassed by the behavior of his assistants. It seemed to him that they behaved this way because they wanted to get close to someone of noble blood. After all, even though they worked in the palace, they were still ordinary people. And because of that, the other royal families looked down on them. But at the same time, neither Baikal, the twins, nor Charisse herself had ever harassed them because of their status. Such people were rare in the royal family, so this family could be considered special. The protagonist realized that she was so well-received also because everyone was very grateful to Baikal for his sensitive attitude and care for his employees. So she wanted to repay her beloved father even more and do a good job. With even more enthusiasm, she began to prepare a healing ointment from calendula. The girl poured freshly picked sunflowers into a sterilized jar and then added orange blossoms to give this ointment a sweet, refreshing aroma. When these ingredients were mixed together, the aroma became even more pleasant. After that, enough oil had to be added to fill all the calendula, and finally, pine needles had to be added, and this jar had to be closed tightly. After all these procedures, everything was ready, and now this ointment had to be left for a month, so that the sunflower oil would turn into an infused oil that could be used as a miracle cure. But time was needed for everything. The maid thought that the girl wanted to present it as a gift to the royal family members, but what she really wanted to do was for her faithful maid. But until now, she couldn't admit it. So now, smiling happily and pointing at the work that had been done, Charisse revealed that it was all done just for her. The maid looked very confused when she realized that so precious medicine, made by the hands of the princess, will go to her, because of which she began to worry very much. But the protagonist calmly explained to the girl that she did not want her to use any more not very good medicines in case she gets hurt, and also so that she wouldn't have to go to the medical office every time 
or agonize in case she got hurt. Cherise realized that despite her wish, it was likely that there might be a situation where the maid would get hurt again, and that was something she needed to be prepared for in advance. That was how she decided to prepare a new miracle ointment. The girl once again felt immense gratitude for such warm words, but she didn't understand how the princess could care so much about an ordinary maid. She promised to remain loyal to the princess until the end of her days, and, happily hugging the protagonist, explained that it was the first time she had received such a valuable gift. And an awkward Cherise tried to think of a way to calm her down. Meanwhile, the other servants were still diligently picking Calendula to make more servings. They were animatedly discussing the princess, marveling at her kindness and generosity, and how much healing medicine could be made from all those brightly colored flowers. They also never ceased to marvel at the girl's ability to make such a delightful medicine last time. Therefore, they never once doubted her talents. In the end, when everything was finished, poured into jars, and only cleaning was left, the girl asked the princess if they should not, as last time, use the magic of fermentation in order to speed up the process. But the protagonist, after thinking about it, realized that in this situation, fermentation would certainly not help. After all, she needed to achieve a long infusion of herbs, and if she did the same procedures as with the plum syrup, the result would be completely different. But the protagonist could not argue her knowledge in any way, so she explained that she wanted to act already known to her reliable method. After all, in this case, the result will definitely be as it should be. Then the girl suggested to try to take one of the jars and use spells on it. In case, if the result was what was necessary, they could do it with the rest of the copies. If not, they would be left in a cool place to infuse for a month anyway. The maid who was listening to them from the side smiled happily, remembering her youth. She said that this kind of preparation reminded her of her grandmother. After all, back in the days when she was young, every home had her grandmother's recipe for medicine. And that was even before the times when it was forbidden to make any medicines on their own. Over time, when her mother was still young, the temple began to gain strength. So if a family made their own medicine, they were considered witches. The maid understood that on the one hand, it was right to issue licenses to sell medicines and practice medicine. After all, it allowed to control the quality of potions and stop quackery. But on the other hand, it deprived ordinary people of the opportunity to take care of their own health, using the means proven by many generations of their ancestors. And often the prices of licensed medicines were so high that the poor could not afford them. Listening to this story, the protagonist thought about how important it is to find the golden mean between safety and accessibility of medicine, and she firmly decided that she would do her best to make sure that her miracle ointment could help as many people in need as possible. But noticing her agitation, the woman placed the wreath she had woven on the girl's head and reassured her, explaining that the era of brutal witch hunts was gradually fading into the past, and people were beginning to live more peacefully, although they were forgetting the wisdom of their ancestors. While they were talking, the protagonist realized that if everything worked out as she planned, then the level of knowledge in medicine would be restored in the empire. That's why she was thinking about the day when she would be able to finish her achievement quest, get the money, and make the whole empire happy. At the same time, Baikal was standing with a holiday box in his hands, discussing with Sophia about the surprise party they were planning to throw for Cherise. He didn't think the party should be very lavish, but Sophia was convinced that any celebration needed colorful, bright decorations. Especially since an adoption party didn't happen every day, so she wanted to do everything she could to make it a truly memorable day for the princess. Baikal also agreed with her thoughts, because despite how everything looked, he still thought that the decoration wasn't luxurious enough. After that, he applied a bit of magic and used a magic spell to make the surrounding plum trees bloom again, pleasing the eye with their delicate petals. Eventually, all the preparations were finished, and everything looked just perfect, just in time for the arrival of the two princes who appeared from the shining portal. Then Idsit, activating another portal, informed his father that they had prepared many wonderful gifts for his little sister. Looking around at all this mountain of presents, some of which belonged to the princes and some to other families, Sophia realized that this was the largest number of gifts the princesses had ever received. The prince knew that most of these gifts were sent as a courtesy to flatter him, 
but he chose to accept them because he was in a good mood and also because it was all meant for his beloved daughter. And now it was time for the main character to take the stage. So the man began to recite the spell. Finally, a dazzling salute appeared in the sky, indicating to the servants that it was time for the princess to come out. Charisse herself also noticed this enchanting fireworks display and asked her grandmother what was going on. Then the woman, smiling conspiratorially, explained that the preparations were finished, and now she had a little surprise waiting for her. As the girl approached the necessary area, she froze in admiration at how beautiful everything around her was. Everything was brightly decorated, with plum tree petals floating in the air and delicious, appetizing dishes on the tables. She could not believe that it had all been done in secret from her, and with such care. Immediately, two stately boys appeared in front of her, welcoming her sister to her feast and complimenting her charming outfit and wreath, which pleased her greatly. As they approached, Idsit requested that his sister make a similar wreath for him as well, but she had already taken care of that. So handed the prince his own wreath. She ran up to her father as well, and happily held out the wreath to him. Of course, the girl wasn't sure if everyone would want to wear it, but she hoped they would like it. Baikal, without a second's hesitation, immediately put the wreath on his head and surprisingly looked very good in it. Idsit, leaning toward his sister, asked that the girl personally adorn his head with the wreath, and Hersey, who wished to keep his brutality, could not believe that all serious men suddenly began to wear flower wreaths. The girl, smiling slyly, promised to give the wreath specially made for Gersich, to someone else if he did not want to wear it. Eventually, the embarrassed boy, who didn't want to give his wreath to some other person, explained to his sister that he didn't want to part with his wreath, but he couldn't wear something so girly. But eventually, after a couple more minutes of coaxing, the boy himself snatched the wreath out of his sister's hands, put it on his head, and started looking insanely cute. Eventually, the brothers started jokingly arguing amongst themselves, discussing which one of them looked better in that wreath, and they demanded that Charisse vote and decide which one of them was more handsome. But then, rescuing his daughter from her annoying brothers, came Baikal, who, taking her in his arms, announced that the adoption process had been fully completed, and from that moment on, the girl was officially his favorite daughter. This news filled Charisse's heart with incredible joy and pride, now she finally had the real family she had long dreamed of.